You're listening to international investment advisor Doug Goldstein on the Goldstein on Yelp Show, the financial show where we'll talk about how you can make the most of your money. With all the confusing financial chatter bombarding you each and every day, Goldstein on Yelp will give you the practical information you want and need about living a financially stable life. Here's your host, money maven Doug Goldstein. Okay, we are back. We're talking to Brian Luff from London, who runs an organization called Think Funny, which has workshops for individuals and businesses who want to learn more about comedy writing. Brian, pleasure to have you. Good to uh, talk to you, Doug. So what's Think Funny all about? Well, I, when I started writing for, uh, for TV about uh, 10, 15 years ago, I used to get lots of emails from people saying, how do I break into the business? I'd really like to be a, a comedy writer. So first of all, we started doing a workshop uh, about how to write sketches for TV. And uh, a lot of people, came, in fact, people came from all over the UK for these workshops. And uh, it became it's quite quickly became quite a significant part of, of our production company. So we decided to offer a whole range of workshops. Uh, we do one about stand up comedy where we take people who want to do their first ever stand up gig and we help to build their confidence. Uh, we teach them uh, techniques for brainstorming uh, ideas. We teach them a bit of microphone technique. Um, and we basically tell them all of the mistakes that people make when they first do their, their, their first stand-up gig. Because uh, it's a scary thing. I hear. Okay. So that was the, the original. and But now you do more corporate work. So you teach people in industry how to be funny. Yeah. We're like, for example, next week we're doing a workshop for a company in the city of London. Um, who have a team of uh, customer facing people and uh, we are taking them to a hotel for for three days and each day 10 of them are going to write material about the company and at the end of each day they're going to do a show to their colleagues and uh, hopefully they're going to get some laughs but they're going to go from a standing start having never performed comedy before and in one day they're going to uh, become comedy performers. Um, it's scary stuff. Yeah. So what can you actually teach someone? We start off by by teaching them a bit of the theory. Uh, I mean, you can't if someone's not naturally funny, you can't make them funny, but you can teach them techniques. And a lot of the techniques that uh, comedians use are very tried and tested. They are very formulaic. Uh, things like the rule of three, things like using repetition, using what we call substitution and callback. These are all things that you can actually teach. And even if you're not the funniest born guy in the world, learning these techniques can actually, if you like, help you to fake it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'll share with you that I'm interested in comedy. I've, in fact, spoken to a number of comedy teachers as well over the years what i'm having a little trouble is explaining why i as a you know my real life job is i'm a financial advisor i spend most of my time not on the radio but rather dealing with individual clients talking about their their retirement and how to save uh, why would someone in my position want to learn comedy you wouldn't necessarily go on stage and talk about all of that stuff although they do say that you should write about what you know and a lot of the stories are very funny but of course i couldn't say that <laughs> A lot of people completely reinvent themselves when, when they go on stage. Um, I mean, I don't know whether you're, you've ever seen a, com a British comedian called Harry Hill. Now, this guy is, has created almost a, a cartoon uh, version of himself. So in some ways, you can go and become the complete opposite of your real self on stage. Um, and, and in doing that, it's very liberating. So you've always got that, that choice. You can either be an exaggerated version of yourself and go and tell stories about independent financial advice, or you could dress up as a, as a page three uh, model and, uh, and you could do a completely different routine about, uh, about being a page three model in, in, in the tabloid press, for example. I don't know why I picked that. <laughs> All right. So how can people, let's say they're not going to go and become stand-up uh, comics, let's say that someone wants to learn the tools of comedy so he can use it in the workplace, perhaps maybe from a, a leadership standpoint or a team building standpoint. What are we looking at here? Well, it's, comedy is a communication skill. And uh, if you can make people smile, in my view, I think people are more likely to, uh, to like you and to trust you, whether or, or not you're on stage or whether or not that is in a business setting. Um, it can go badly wrong. I'm sure you've seen uh, David Brent in the office. 
Um, now, this is a character uh, created by Ricky Gervais, who was trying so hard to be entertaining and funny in the workplace that it actually backfired on him. And, and he became a figure of fun, but for the wrong reason. So mm-hmm. that's right. But there's no, a lot of people that, um, that come on our workshops um, are not actually planning to be uh, stand-up comedians as a job, but they simply want to become more confident people. And they think to themselves, well, if I go, can go on stage in a, a comedy club in front of 500 people, then that, that's going to make addressing the board meeting on Monday to a, a handful of people seem quite easy in uh, in comparison. Okay, I hear that, that 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 makes sense. It gives you the confidence by learning to actually stand up and tell stories or, or jokes, anecdotes, that when time comes and you have to say something that's even more difficult, or maybe it's less difficult because if you've already embarrassed yourself on stage, you might be able to go ahead and actually present to your work. I do workshops on Skype and uh, one of the guys that I did a workshop with like, this time last year was a, uh, a vicar in Southampton in uh, the south of England and all the, when he came on uh, the Think Funny workshops all he actually wanted to do was to improve his confidence and to make his sermons in church more uh, entertaining. More, mm-hmm. entertaining. We persuaded him to actually go and do a 10-minute stand-up routine in a comedy club. <laughs> <laughs> that, that must have been something to see. He loved it. I went along for the gig and he is actually now now become quite addicted to the whole idea of becoming a stand-up comedian, despite the fact that that wasn't why he came to us in the in the first place. Well, it's a good fallback in case the uh, church thing doesn't work out for him. We are talking with Brian Luff, who has been in the comedy world for decades. He runs Think Funny, which teaches individuals and businesses to learn more about comedy or to use it for other aspects of their business, like team building or, or leadership questions or leadership development. Brian, I want to touch on something you mentioned before, which is if someone's a real uh, wet towel, it might be hard to teach them to be funny. But how can you really teach someone? What are some of the tools that you that you bring to the table to convert someone in one day from being uh, a regular guy to being pretty funny? Well, you have to remember that, that people that write comedy for a living, their brains are wired slightly different from the rest of the universe. Mm-hmm. The world in a completely different way. But some of the ways they look at the world are, as I said, very formulaic. I'll give you an example. Um, there's a technique called the rule of three. Now, writers use the rule of three. People that uh, give um, speeches use the rule of three all the time. You will see politicians continually give information in one, two, three blocks. So I'll, I'll give you a, a, an example of a rule of three joke, um, which is a, by a British comedian in the UK called Jimmy Carr. And the rule of three is this. Isn't it weird when you wake up in bed in the morning and you look at the woman lying next to you and you can't remember one, where you met her, <laughs> two, what her name is, or three, why she's dead? <laughs> That's an example of rule of three, where you, you give information. The first thing sets up what the subject is. The second thing underlines uh, the, the subject, so the audience completely get their head around what the joke is. And then the third thing distorts it, turns it on its head, puts a spin on it, confounds your expectation of what was going to happen next. And that's just one example of a tool. Rule of three is something that comedians use all the time. But there's a whole string of those types of tools that in the space of a, a day, you can teach people and it changes the rhythm uh, of the way they write. And it makes them instinctively start to, to, to structure what they say in a way that invites a laugh. Mm-hmm. All right. Now, I was thinking like, uh, you know, in my job, so if, if, if we might take the last couple of minutes, maybe we'll talk about uh, this concept of rule of three. I'll sit and I'll talk with a husband and a wife. And really, I spend a lot more time as a marriage counselor, I think, than as a financial advisor, because that's just the way it goes. Where would I, if I wanted to tell stories about that, where would I, where would I start to find the three things, or you had mentioned before, repetition? Well, I tell you, when we do workshops with individuals, and not with companies, uh, one of the exercises that we do during the afternoon, having taken them through a series of these 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 tools, is we get them to dig deep into their into their uh, memories and try and find a story, an anecdote that we can work with. 
And there are various triggers that we use for that. And the most common trigger and the one that gets the best results for us is we say to them, tell us something that you would not tell your mother. OK, I can think of many things. <laughs> that unlocks awful stuff in most people's minds. And you can imagine that obviously on the stand up circuit, particularly in London, there is a lot of adult material. Flying. Sure. OK, this is public radio, so we won't go for the adult stuff. <laughs> necessarily have to be sometimes it can just be a dark secret because stand-up comedy at its best is confessional mm -hmm. and if you wanted to go and do uh, stand-up yourself Doug that would be a very good place to start it would be saying what would I like to confess to this room full of people okay and that gives you sort of that's how you find the story and then you use one of the tools what are some other tools you mentioned the rule of three repetition what are some other big ones that Massive. Uh, there's, there's so many different ways of using repetition. You can repeat words um, over and over again. An example of that would be the famous Monty Python sketch that goes spam, 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 spam. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you can create catchphrases using uh, repetition by using the same uh, sequence of words over and over again. Like, for example, uh, the Catherine Tate sequence of am I bothered? Am I bothered? Um, you can create uh, whole items um, in, in certain shows. Uh, comedy writers actually almost use copy and paste to actually create the same situation over and over again and very slightly change it each time. I don't know whether you guys get a show called Little Britain, but in Little Britain, a lot of the sketches are almost identical to the week before, except that one different thing happens. And the reason we like repetition is because it makes us feel safe. We kind of know what's coming. And when we feel safe, there's that sense of familiarity and that makes us feel relaxed. And when we feel relaxed, we're more likely to laugh. Uh, music mm -hmm. as well. Pop music uses repetition over and over again. The pop, pop songs use the same lines over and over again. We, we like to know what's coming next. We like this sense that something isn't going to be a surprise. And then you get thrown off when it doesn't, <laughs> when at some point in the repetition it's something different. Surprise also makes people laugh, but you would be surprised how often people are prepared to laugh even though they know what's coming next. How many times have you seen a stand-up comedian who uses the same catchphrase or the same routine or very similar routine every time? And the audience actually get to learn to love it in the same way as, uh, you know, when a band goes on stage, everyone expects them to play their, their greatest hit. Mm -hmm. All right. I guess that's what happens to me when I go on stage. They go, ah, oh, it's Doug Goldstein. He's going to talk to us about retirement savings. And they're very excited about that. We have been talking to Brian Luff. Brian, we're just about out of time, but in the last few seconds, could you just tell me, how can people follow you? Uh, they can follow us by going to thinkfunny.co.uk, which is our uh, corporate uh, website. I also do a podcast as well called Comedy 365, uh, and, and uh, that's available on iTunes. Okay, it sounds great. Brian Luff, thanks so much for your time. Good to talk to you, Doug. You've been listening to the Goldstein on Gelt Show with money maven Doug Goldstein. Doug's weekly radio show is heard around the world, but if you miss it, you can download the podcast at www.goldsteinongelt.com. The Goldstein on Gelt Show gives you up-to-date financial ideas so you can get on the path to financial freedom. If you'd like your questions answered on the air or off, send Doug an email to Doug at profile-financial.com. It's your money for your future, so join Doug every week to build your wealth on the Goldstein on Gelt Show.